Hello everyone, I think we are going to get started now, it's um, two o'clock UK time. Uh, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. My name is Juliet Tunstall and I'm the uh, External Events Officer here at IID. Uh, today's event is looking at how subsidies can accelerate universal energy access and I'm really looking forward to the discussion we're going to have with some great speakers today. Um, the event today is hosted in partnership with Kivos and Tier Fund and is part of the IIED debates webinar series which aims to create a space for conversation and debate on key and current sustainable development issues. If you're interested in getting regular updates on these events, uh, we have a newsletter and I will send the link to that towards the end of the session. Uh, we are expecting a lot of participants today and uh, you're hoping you're going to be joining us from all over the world. So while we wait for a few more people to tune in, um, I'm just going to quickly run through how we're going to use the Zoom tools and get the most from this session and then we can uh, get started. So that is it from me. I'm now going to hand over to Rita Poppe, who, who is the um, Global Advocacy Officer for Green and Inclusive Energy at HEVOS and our moderator for today's session. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the conversation. So thank you, Juliet. Um, warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining. Uh, we have a strong set of speakers today and an impressive number of participants and that's uh, even counting. Um, as said, focus of today's session is an exchange on the design and key components of subsidies, energy subsidies, to accelerate universal energy access. Uh, up to now, significant, significant progress has been made in improving access to electricity. However, some 800 million people still don't have access. And for clean cooking, the picture is even more grim. 2.8 billion people worldwide still go, to, go without clean and safe uh, cooking solutions. Again, it's 2.8 billion. Uh, availability of finance in the right format is one of the major tricks to closing the energy access gap. And within finance, uh, subsidies can play a major role. The use of subsidies is currently often neglected, with key players shying away from using it. This event will cast some light on how subsidies can accelerate energy access and how it should be designed to do so. Uh, for this, I would like to present you our speakers who will contribute to this discussion, each from, the, from their own perspective. So we will start with Stephen Nash, who is the founder of Kungana Advisory and has been working with Tearfund. Uh, on subsidies research. Uh, he's followed by Nepunika Pereira, who is a researcher in IAD Shaping Sustainability Markets Research Group. And uh, after the two presentations, we have uh, a panel uh, consisting of Satish Gautam, who is the National uh, Program Manager of the Renewable Energy for Rural Livelihood in Nepal. Then we have Linda Vamun, who is the Founder and Managing Director of Economy in Kenya. And we have Daniel Kidwa, who is the finance lead at Africa Mini Grid Developers Association, based in Nairobi. And finally, finally we have uh, Dana Rizenkova, who is the global lead for energy access at the World Bank. So this will be our set of speakers and uh, panelists. A uh, quick overview of the event. We will first start after this with a poll, quick poll to have a sense of your uh, subsidy feelings. Then um, we go over to uh, Stephen and Nipunika, who will both present recent research and then followed by the panel as I described, uh, just described. And then we do another poll to see how uh, the successful the panel and the speakers were in uh, explaining you the usefulness of subsidies. And then um, we close with an, uh, a Q&A session in which you can participate as explained by Juliet. Uh, for all your burning questions, and you can post your questions already throughout the whole session in the Q&A box. So we are looking forward to a, a vivid exchange. And um, first of all, we go over to the poll. So the question is, do you think energy subsidies are essential for achieving universal energy access? And the answer options are quite straightforward, very much so, somewhat, slightly, or not at all. Okay, just sharing the results, Rita, can you see those? No, oh, no, I don't know why, but I can't see them. Okay, I can run through the results for you. So we had 73% at very much so, 26% at somewhat, and 1% at slightly, 0% not at all. Okay, so there's a clear preference, but still um, somewhat to gain, I would say. 
So um, I would like to continue by inviting Stephen to um, present the findings of his recent research. Thank you, Rita, for the introduction. I'm just going to share the slides, which are hopefully up now. Okay, so thanks very much for the introduction, Rita. Um, as um, Rita mentioned, I'm going to be presenting some research that we've recently been carrying out, was commissioned by Tear Fund. Tear Fund is a Christian relief and development agency focused on ending global poverty. Um, this research is part of their work on climate change and energy access. Um, and this is actually the second paper um, following a, a paper that we published in 2018 that was looking more generally at the role of subsidies uh, in accelerating progress on energy access. So I'm going to start just very quickly um, with uh, a little bit of context, which I'm sure that most people on the webinar are familiar with. Uh, so I think most of us are aware that there's a, a big gap still between where we are at the moment and uh, successfully achieving SDG 7. So Sustainable Development Goal 7, the goal of um, reaching universal access to, to energy. Um, on current trends in 2030, um, we would still have several hundred million people without access to electricity. And as Rita was saying, a far bigger gap without access to clean cooking. The current COVID-19 crisis really puts this into to focus. Um, on the one hand, the challenge is greater than ever. Um, we saw just this week, um, new sales data for the first half of this year come out of Gogla, um, showing a big drop in, in sales. But at the same time, we also know, of course, that energy access can be a great um, facilitator of, of giving communities more resilience to cope with some of the challenges that are being posed to them uh, at the moment. So turning to subsidies then and how they can be used. So I think when we're talking about subsidies, the first thing we need to be really clear on is what we're trying to achieve with the subsidy. Um, and normally we are talking about one or two things or, or more frequently, I guess, a combination of the two. Um, so the first one is high cost of service. So in a lot of the areas uh, where there remains a, a large energy access gap in rural areas, for instance, the cost of service is higher. So capex might be higher and the ongoing costs of servicing those areas might be higher. So there might be higher customer service costs, higher maintenance costs and so on. Now this of course is not unique to delivering of grid distributed uh, energy access solutions. Uh, it also is, is the case in delivering a grid-based electricity system. Uh, it's also not unique to developing markets. So this is a challenge you know, when you're running an electricity system in a developed market or middle income country as well. And these differences importantly will, will persist. They'll, they'll remain the case um, as is illustrated by looking at those more developed markets. The other thing that we're often talking about when we're looking at designing uh, subsidies is looking at affordability gaps. So also in these rural areas, we tend to have communities that have a lower ability to pay for energy services. Uh, and so there's an affordability gap. Now, hopefully this affordability gap will decline with time um, as um, households increase their earnings and so on. But some of those affordability gaps may persist we see in more developed countries uh, that energy poverty remains an, an issue in many cases, for instance. Now, because in both of these areas, to a greater or lesser extent, these issues may persist. Maybe me talking about subsidy design is, is a little bit of an error at the outset of this discussion. Maybe you should be thinking about this more as a market design challenge. And how do we design a, mar a market? What's the target model look like in let's say 2030 or 2035, not just to deliver energy access and to close the gap, but to sustain that performance as well. So before I move on, I just want to very quickly nod to a few other reports and trends over the last couple of years. I think the debate has moved on a long way in subsidies and, and the poll attested to this as well. 
um, that you know, if we'd done this presentation a couple of years ago, I think there would have been perhaps a lot more pushback against the idea um, of subsidies. But uh, the, the, the papers that I've got on the screen now, there's definitely not a, a complete list at all. There's lots of literature out there and it's growing all the time, some great work. But, um, but there's a, a lot of work being done and it's obviously a lot of debate around what the subsidies look like but increasing acceptance that we need to, to use them. Or as I was saying, maybe it's not quite top of these, but some sort of intervention uh, or market design intervention that helps us to deliver energy access. Now, of course, when we talk about subsidies, um, it's not quite that straightforward. There are lots of different design levers that we can pull um, and subsidy design in itself is a complex area. I've listed some of the design uh, characteristics uh, or levers that we can pull on this slide. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but just gives you a sense of some of the decisions that you need to make when designing a subsidy scheme. How targeted is that scheme? Where does the funding come from? To what extent does the subsidy uh, you just provide a funding input versus providing some sort of results-based signal. Is the subsidy only awarded to you know, one or two service providers or is it open to everybody? Um, how is the subsidy allocated and what is the scope of the subsidy, both in geographical terms and in terms of the technologies or modes of delivery that it might cover? So as part of the work um, for Tier Fund, um, we've looked at experience from across a wide range of subsidy schemes um, to try and understand what lessons we can draw from those, what has worked and what has worked less well. We've looked across a range of different geographies um, and that's shown with the map on the slide, but we've also looked across a number of different delivery modes. So we've looked at on-grid electrification, we've looked at off-grid electrification, um, but we've also looked at clean cooking to try and draw out some of the key messages. So a lot of this is covered in the paper, but I want to just highlight a few of the really key lessons that are coming out of that. So one is that particularly when we're looking at distributed technologies, sustainability is a, is a really big issue. So, um, a lot of schemes that have been deployed in the past have achieved good results up front of increased connections, which of course is the thing that they're trying to achieve in the first instance. But those um, results have then maybe not been uh, sustained over time. So when evaluations have been taken, um, have taken place several years after the scheme was rolled out, people have perhaps lost access to energy. Uh, maybe companies that were delivering the services have dropped out of the market. Maybe the maintenance provision that's in place was not sufficient. Maybe there's not enough customer service presence in place. And then those cost of service differences that we were talking about earlier have persisted and there hasn't been the provision in the market to address that per persistent gap. Um, now, We've got a lot of results-based finance schemes that have been introduced over the last few years that again are achieving good results up front. Um, and you know, I think it's far too early at the moment to really um, understand the extent to which these issues have been addressed with those. Um, but it'll be interesting to see over the coming years to what extent these issues persist or whether they have been tackled. I just want to have a look quickly at one of the lessons from elsewhere. And this is looking at an on-grid um, electricity system and it's looking specifically at Thailand. Now this Thailand, Thailand example that I'm gonna talk through quickly um, is repeated really in on-grid electricity systems all over the world in developed and middle-income countries. I'm picking the Thai example just because it's particularly uh, transparent and easy to understand. In Thailand, there are two different distribution companies, one for the urban areas around Bangkok um, and one for more rural areas. And there was a huge cross subsidy that takes place from the urban distribution company to the rural distribution company every year. On top of that, um, there is um, a funding mechanism for, um, for free electricity to the, the least well off consumers. Now, without getting into the, the merits or otherwise of these specific policy measures, the point that is really important to take away from this is, um, is really that it's primarily funded by consumers and cross subsidies. 
Um, so this is moving about $350 million every year around the system, most of it just consumer money um, to deal with these persistent cost of service um, differences. Now, of course, we can't just lift this model um, and drop it into sub-Saharan Africa today. One of the many reasons why off-grid electricity systems are being used in such a way is that the utility systems in many of these countries are broken and not creditworthy. But we can use the model we just looked at, we can think about that as a target model and then think about how we might step back from that and evolve towards it over time and how the funding sources might change. So acknowledging that on day one, um, most of the funding would need to come from the likes of donors. Um, over time, governments might step in to take a, a greater share of that before eventually moving towards something that is self-funding and sustainable and funded by customers themselves. So I know that I'm just about over um, out, of, out of time, so I'm not going to go through every single one of the policy recommendations in detail, but I just want to highlight two really key points. So the first one is this sustainability point um, and the idea that we really need to make sure that we're, we're clear on what our subsidy is trying to achieve or our market design intervention is trying to achieve um, and how it's going to sustain results over time. Um, and our view is that probably means it needs to be systemic. Um, it needs to be as standardized as possible. And we really need to think about how we're gonna scale results to bring in cheaper forms of funding as well. Um, and then the second point is really thinking about where we can draw lessons from elsewhere and not reinventing the wheel where we, we don't need to. Um, there are models that we can draw on from, uh, from elsewhere in the energy sector, um, but also, of course, out from other sectors um, as well. So you can get a lot more detail um, in the, the papers that have been published on, on Tier Fund's website and do, of course, get in touch with this if you have any questions on that. And I look forward to um, questions during the, the Q&A shortly as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this very clear picture and nice overview of designs and means of delivery of uh, energy subsidies. Uh, I would like to hand over to um, Nipunika, who will give another view on uh, subsidies. Thanks, Rita. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and um, hi, everyone. Um, so what I'm about to present uh, next uh, really builds on some of the uh, uh, discussion points that Stephen has already made and um, uh, looks a bit deeper into some examples that, um, uh, that we've looked in in this uh, particular research. Um, uh, so just to s start with how we uh, started this work, uh, so in order to unpack subsidies in line with the discourse and how subsidies are currently being looked at, um, IID with uh, support from HEVOS um, uh, developed this discussion paper, uh, in particularly looking at demand side subsidies that aim to reduce cost to the end users and supply side subsidies that aim to reduce cost to the energy suppliers who want to enter remote geographies or new markets. Um, but it's also well known that subsidies on its own is not the silver bullet. Uh, it is an instrument that is heavily dependent on already scarce public finance. Therefore, commercial finance has a significant role to play. So this paper also aims to highlight some insights into how commercial can, uh, finance need, is needed and how it can play a role. Um, this diagram really really links to what Stephen mentioned earlier on how we need subsidies and why we need subsidies. And it also builds on several recent publications that aims to present how markets can be segmented uh, based on affordability gap, which in this diagram increases as you go from top to bottom, um, uh, and commercial geographic reach, which reduces as you go from left to right of the diagram. The S's and the D's here indicate where supply side and demand side subsidies are more suitable depending on these two conditions. However, in reality, this is not always neatly segmented like this. Uh, there are overlaps between different affordability groups um, uh, living in a specific job in one geographic location um, and the economic conditions shift constantly. So um, to, we, we will discuss this more uh, in the next, I will discuss this more in the next slide as I go deeper into the Nepal case study. Um, 
So to look a bit deeper into how demand side subsidies have been delivered, we looked at Nepal uh, as a case in point. Nepal has been delivering subsidies since the 1970s. Uh, and there has been commendable commitment from the government, national government in terms of allocating public funds for decentralized renewable energy subsidies, um, establishing a dedicated institu institution called the Alternative Energy Promotion Center, which led subsidy mobilization where donors could also come in and pool finance and align technical assistance support. Um, and has also created a, quite a strong enabling environment with dedicated subsidy policies. So while we discuss quite uh, in quite detail in our uh, uh, publication um, uh, as a case study, I wanted to highlight three key lessons that we found here. Uh, the subsidy policy in Nepal defined subsidies based on remoteness, um, and included um, and it also included an, uh, included an additional subsidy for specific beneficiary groups. Um, which included a uh, group such as the Dalit community who are often disadvantaged um, as the lowest caste across the country. So these two di diagrams uh, shows results from a sample survey carried out as part of this research. Uh, they indicate that despite having an additional subsidy, um, Dalit communities uh, uh, were still at the bottom of access levels for electricity and clean cooking. Uh, compared to more affluent and higher cost groups. Uh, the results give some indication um, into when subsidies are allocated with uh, restricted program timelines and with sort of a blanket subsidy that allow anyone within a certain geography access them, it can still exclude the most marginalized communities. Uh, secondly, um, having systemic processes for quality assurance, for technology verification or te uh, technician verifications, uh, qualifying companies really helped at the start to create a strong market for various uh, DRE technologies. However, complexities of these processes and delays eventually created various bottlenecks. Uh, so, for example, uh, energy companies uh, ended up increasing retail price to end users to cover uh, high administrative costs um, or the delayed payments, uh, if, if impacts of delayed payments. This sort of defeats the purpose of a demand side subsidy. Um, while various steps have been taken over the years by in, in Nepal to address these um, issues, um, identifying these risks sooner with periodic assessments could have potentially helped mitigate some of these negative impacts uh, on the ongoing programs and also weaving it better into newer programs. And finally, Nepal has benefited significantly with long-term donor and government funding for subsidies compared to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this has contributed to creating a market with many local companies. However, it eventually also became very highly dependent on subsidies. Um, uh, for instance, some energy companies really struggled to survive following reductions of donor funding that were funding that was going into subsidies. Um, so moving on into uh, supply side subsidies, we also looked quite closely um, at emerging lessons on resource-based financing or RBF as it's commonly known uh, at, at, uh, now. Um, uh, and it's becoming a very popular tool, uh, particularly in Africa currently. Um, RBF focused mostly uh, on geographic targeting. Uh, in the report, we present several lessons from end of RBF facility and recent programs, such as the Kenya off-grid uh, solar access program. Um, but to share a few key insights, um, RBF is indeed a very important financial tool to activate new markets, uh, but on its uh, alone on its own is not sufficient to establish long-term market viability. Uh, it really requires backing from affordable commercial finance, where companies um, can rely on uh, to pre-finance their products and services until RBF gets released to them. Uh, it has the opportunity to improve quality assurance, but there are also risks similar to what I mentioned from Nepal that could affect uh, delivery. Um, most companies who have so far benefited from RBF are larger, com larger international companies with very strong back, uh, track records and finance to expand to um, remote geographies. Uh, so, to, so if you want to unblock finance to smaller local companies, there is a need to really combine this with technical assistance support and even to look back at some of the processes such as qualification processes of companies and making them less stringent. Um, finally, we know that RBF is a market enabling instrument and is not often 
um, intended, intended to reach uh, the poorest communities. But there has been some really interesting examples that's been uh, uh, coming out from the piloted schemes. For example, in Malawi, uh, RBF has been combined with a demand side subsidy to target marginalized communities. So moving on into some of the key recommendations there that came out. Um, so the lessons in this study uh, so far really indicated to us that there is a huge need for better targeting. Because if you understand who needs subsidies the most, you can combine uh, a mix of financing instruments for different end uses based on their affordability um, and the context they come from. Uh, for this, you need to define better, but understanding the context and the end user needs um, um, and to develop appropriate subsidy delivery mechanisms that uh, don't exclude marginalized communities require more effort. Um, different end users have different marginalizations and they face different challenges when accessing finance. Uh, for instance, the Dalits in Nepal tend to migrate more frequently and this might have affected their ability to provide identities or certain types of proofs that are needed to access the subsidy. So for this, the elephant in the room is sort of data, the availability of data. Data often becomes a significant bottleneck when designing financing uh, instruments. But there are different approaches that are already there to address data gaps. Uh, for instance, uh, participatory and localized planning approaches are key to co-generated, uh, to, be, to be able to co-generate data with local communities and local stakeholders. Uh, for instance, in Nepal, the FCDO funded Nepal Renewable Energy Program is currently working with provincial level and local level governments to link with existing planning mechanisms. Uh, local governments in Nepal already have um, uh, and have been using a participatory planning uh, approach each year. This provides an entry point to integrate energy into an existing mechanism. Similarly, in Kenya, um, IIED is working with various partners using, energy, uh, using uh, the energy delivery model planning approach uh, to engage with communities to understand their priority needs, uh, build ownership and develop solutions that are tailored to the local context. Uh, the solutions um, eventually will include delivery models and financing options specific to target groups. So collecting data using such tools can be a bit exhausting and it's expensive, it, it, it is time, time consuming. Uh, but what we see is that investing um, upfront in these type of approaches can really help to avoid failures um, and un unintended consequences that could rise in the future. Um, and at times you don't even need to reinvent data. The Malawi example, the RBF Malawi example, for instance, really showed that there are, there is, there are existing uh, data options that you can use uh, in Malawi. The RB program is the social uh, government's social cash transfer program uh, to um, target marginalized communities, and it did it quite successfully. Secondly, um, identifying and managing risks early is critical when deploying time bound financing schemes. Um, so just to go, uh, I've, I've touched upon these uh, in, um, in, in the past slides, but just to very quickly uh, look at one of them. Uh, so lack of end user awareness was raised as a uh, as, as potentially a very uh, 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 a strong barrier that might have avoided marginalized communities such as Dalits to access uh, subsidy related information and eventually benefit from them. Um, and another benefit of knowing target groups better is that you can develop a mix of financing instruments. Um, more affluent households can benefit from credit-based instruments. Um, and there are some examples that we have presented in the study, such as uh, work by UNCDF, building partnerships and providing technical assistance uh, to commercial banks, energy companies, and microfinance institutions to provide end user credit. And finally, just to wrap up the presentation, we really looked at the need and the importance of commercial finance. Um, as um, it is a challenge, it is an area that needs a lot more effort um, and understanding. There is limited success stories and countries like Nepal are still struggling to blend in commercial finance into decentralized renewable energy. But we know that as donor funding uh, is uh, being more threat th threatened due to uh, issues such as the pandemic and global politics. This is really an area that needs further, uh, further effort. Um, for, I'm just going to end it here. This sort of gives an overview of some of our key publications. Um, I'm just handing over to you, uh, Rita. 
Thanks a lot, Nipunika. Uh, very good overview of key lessons, best practices, and uh, good inspiration for uh, the rest of the event. Um, now that we have listened to the presentations, uh, I would like to invite our panelists to respond to the findings by uh, Nipunika and Stephen. Uh, based on the challenges and opportunities of public funded subsidies from each perspective. Um, and each of uh, the respondents has about three to five minutes uh, to reflect on the presentations and findings. And um, I would like to ask Satish from uh, Nepal. Can I start with you? Um, we know that in Nepal, government has always contributed significant proportions towards decentralized renewable energy subsidies along donors and is continuing to put more funds on subsidizing mini grids and cooking solutions. Having listened to the lessons and recommendations highlighted so far, uh, what lessons are useful for Nepal going forward? What, for example, might be useful for new frontiers in Nepal, like clean cooking and productive uses of energy for some of the poorest? Uh, thank you, Rita, and thank you, Nipu, Nika, and Stephen for your nice presentations. Uh, let me trace back a little on how the subsidy mechanism in Nepal evolved over the years. As Nipunika mentioned, like it started in 1975 as soft credit for agricultural, uh, through agricultural development bank, basically for you know, milling purposes, microhydros were developed for milling. It was only in the eighties when the government delicensed um, power plants up to 100 kilowatt. Uh, then people started uh, putting up micro for electricity generation. And then the following year in 1986, the government started providing subsidy, 50% uh, of the cost of electricity generation and distribution. This was basically to encourage electrification through these existing water mills. After that, a lot of uh, innovations were seen in Nepal, like the local companies, uh, local innovators, they came up with different designs of uh, power units. One multi-purpose power unit was very famous and then uh, they started using induction generator as, uh, induction motor as generators, brought the technology for uh, electronic load controllers and so on. And it went on for about a decade. And then the market kind of saturated and the government started using uh, subsidy, this subsidy that was allocated for microhydro for solar home systems. Um, it was only in 1996, the apex government body called Alternative Energy Promotion Center was established and then the subsidy and credit kind of they separated before it was handled by agriculture development bank. So subsidy and credit were uh, together. They were processed by the same personnel. And when sub subsidy and credit was separated, it became very difficult for uh, rural people to, uh, for timely financial closure of their projects. It used to take years to you know come up with the fund total fund because subsidy only covered 40 45 50 percent of the total cost and the project cost overran there were delays some projects were like half completed and then they had to wait for years to complete it again and so on and what we found is that in a recent uh, study carried out in two provinces of Nepal, that more than 90% of these projects are still operational. They are providing electricity, but the quality of electricity and reliability is very poor. Because the people did not, could not make financial closure on time, like they were using local materials, local uh, laborers, and you know, local highly skilled people to build canals and using like uh, untreated wooden poles and so on. So from Nepal's experience, uh, 
what we find if we look at these microhydros is that in in it really depends on the community community's past experience the community's capacity uh, financial capacity also capacity to manage the conflict in the community etc is directly correlated to the condition of the power plant if the community is well off you'll find the power plants are better run because operators are better paid uh, and there might be opportunities for productive end uses in poor areas the opportunities for productive uses are very limited the tariff rate is very low operators are not paid properly so they run away and there's high turnover of operators and so on so going forward uh, what we see in nepal now because mainly because of the rapid extension of the national grid over 95% of the population has access to electricity so those people who are left are like really in remote areas or they are under the grid very very poor people and these people definitely need subsidy not only subsidy but also a lot of technical support uh, to be to be able to access have access to electricity both for you know lighting and for cooking also thank you thank you satish um this is very insightful um i just name a few of the things you mentioned because i think they're uh, very interesting um building on the other sectors like the agriculture sector finance experience the community capacity and as well as like subsidies as well as technical support in the combination yep. just to keep in mind yeah, then we move over to uh, Linda. Linda, um, you uh, own a uh, Kenyan energy company and um, in off-grid solutions mainly. So can you um, explain a little bit more of what the role is of small businesses here and uh, what resonates with you uh, based on the presentations in terms of challenges and opportunities you face when accessing uh, subsidies like RBF and accessing finance in general? Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Rita. Uh, in terms of the challenges that we face as um, local businesses, th the biggest by far is um, finance challenges. And uh, most small local companies uh, do not have, are not properly resourced, and they don't have the finances that would enable them to, you know, take, take advantage of uh, some opportunities that are offered in terms of, uh, you know, like results-based financing. We have a program that's currently running, the Kenya Off-Grid Solar Access Program, COSAP, and um, it offers supplier-side incentives to encourage uh, distributors to go into, you know, uh, counties, some 14 counties that are off the grid. Um, if we look at these counties, you know, they're sparsely pop populated, very vast, and uh, the population there, the people that live there are very poor. So it's it's very expensive to go into those areas. And unless you have other resources, uh, it's very difficult for a local for, for a local uh, business to you know even take advantage of, of such opportunities. Um, and therefore, they tend to agree with the you know the previous presentations, Nipunika, that they tend to to favor the larger organizations that you know are most of the time foreign are better resourced have other grants possibly other you know contributed income that would enable them to top up and go into these counties as opposed to local uh, companies the other challenge is the yeah technical capacity a lot of uh, uh, local companies because of the financial challenges they have they also don't have that you know and they cannot afford um to hire top talent in terms of uh, capacity building to offer that, that kind of uh, technical support that they may require. So that's another challenge that we face. On the supplier side, I see a challenge even with the with these um, subsidy schemes because um, the current scheme, the, the COSAP scheme that has, has been designed uh, targets, you know, those difficult to reach counties. And it so happens that they're the counties with the highest poverty incidences so you know as high as 80 percent in some counties and um, targeting only supplier side um, incentives and not offering demand incentives 
really is, is, is a difficult balance because these people already don't have the, the financial means to pay for these products. And we, we have, you know, like the, there's a category that I like to define as hardcore poor where, you know, people that sometimes even have only one meal a day, such, such a person, even with incentives and, you know, even if you give them interest-free loans, they cannot be able to pay. And it may, you know, give rise to, um, the concept of probably they they require freely distributed products. How that can be done is another discussion that I believe local governments can come in and support in such cases. So in terms of um, the opportunities that exist, uh, you know, I would say local governments supporting the extremely poor people that cannot afford products. We also have th these extremely poor people in counties that are not classified as COSAP. So other counties that if you look on average, people, you know, are wealthier, but there's that small portion of people, you know, it, it, that cannot afford. So there are um, remote potential markets, but they still have poor people. We have people in informal settlements or extremely poor families that may need um, demand side subsidies. We, there's also more opportunities when it comes to partnerships. So I would say partnerships between these larger organizations that are better resourced with the smaller last mile distributor companies that have better uh, local networks and can easily access these uh, last mile counties uh, without much uh, requiring a lot of money. Also opportunities between you know, other organizations such as local NGOs that may already have um, networks, local networks in these difficult to reach places and they can support with that. Uh, we currently have the um, COSAP 2, which is um, the second round of the result-based financing that's going on, which is also aimed at, uh, it's an improvement of the first one. This one is aimed at encouraging more local companies to take up these opportunities. So the barriers have been significantly lowered and there's a an incentive to encourage, you know, initially, even before uh, you start claiming the, the, the results-based financing, there's an incentive to go into those markets. So there's a, there's a portion of the financing that has been uh, made to incentivize local companies to take up this opportunity. And I believe there's also an element of um, more public finance which may be both, uh, you know, in addition to government, may be larger, uh, local corporates um, that you know may have additional finances to being able to support these markets with uh, you know supporting both the supply side and the demand side uh, subsidies so through probably CSR opportunities where they can take up part of the costs and offer them you know the product cost subsidies that uh, may be required for the extremely uh, poor people so. I would say in a nutshell, uh, that is from my experience. Um, and uh, it's a difficult market that we operate in as um, you know, su suppliers of these energy devices because um, the cost of operations are really high and just you know, operating in a market, an ideal market scenario may not result in, this organ in our organizations being financially sustainable. And you know, commercial financing may not be attractive where a company is not making money. So you know, that's also part of the discussion. Okay, thank you, Lena. Uh, it was very good to hear your on the ground experience, so to say. And uh, it's a pity that we're short of time, but because I think you can go on and on and explain all kind of things. And it's very good to uh, that you like paint this picture. And uh, well, it's good to hear the challenges as well as like new things that are developing, like the course up to which you explained. So that's good news. Then I would like to um, hand over to uh, Daniel, from, Daniel from EMDA, um, from East Africa. Daniel, you are working with many mini grid companies delivering energy for all. So, what lessons from Nepal are useful when thinking through subsidies in the countries that EMDA members are operating in, and how are the financing contexts for energy access different? Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, maybe just to give a bit of perspective on, you know, basically the mini grid sector, you know, in, us, in East Africa and by and large uh, across the continent, uh, you know, we are essentially looking at a fairly 
a new industry, possibly you know five to seven years uh, away from what the solar home system uh, sector used to be. Um, you know, currently the you know average revenue per user is uh, around uh, just under five dollars, um, and also we are looking at lower consumption. So you know, uh, you know, average consumption across the continent is about six uh, six kilowatt hours per month. Uh, and essentially, that already tells you uh, that you know the typical uh, customer base a mini grid uh, operator is, is servicing. This is, you know, possibly uh, you know a, a really remote area where the grid is, uh, you know, years if not decades away from arriving. Um, and in that regard, there's a lot of uh, uh, support in terms of incentives that you know African governments and you know with donor partners can play. Uh, within the mini grid context, uh, we've seen a lot of progress within the RBF, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs. Uh, but I think for uh, where we're looking at in terms of the mini grid model, there's you know another step uh, the you know governments can go, and in this case, you are looking at a possible uh, uh, subsidy on the per kilowatt hour pricing, which is a, you know the tariff in which. Uh, the mini grid operator would, would charge the consumer. Uh, so we're looking at a situation where uh, a lower you know, kilowatt hour pricing uh, can stimulate uh, demand uh, uptake from the consumer. And this, you know, this is not something that uh, you know, is, 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 is new, but I think in some markets we've seen some prototypes being tested. Uh, I can give an example of Tanzania. Uh, where you know one of our partners, uh, Cross Boundary Innovation Lab, has been uh, testing uh, prototypes around how uh, lower kilowatt hour pricing can uh, stimulate demand, and we've seen you know up to in some cases three times uh, the, the growth in demand from consumers. So we are seeing a situation where uh, consumers are really price sensitive, uh, but also I'm seeing a situation where governments can support on the area of uh, financing appliances. Uh, because a lot of these communities are, um, are uh, you know, uh, rural uh, and depend on agriculture. So, so those types of agricultural inputs or uh, assets that can actually consume uh, with the energy the mini grid provider is providing uh, will, would go hand in hand increasing in, in both increasing consumer incomes, uh, improving their quality of life, but also increasing load uh, which you know ultimately also benefits the uh, the mini grid developer in terms of revenue. So I think uh, I think those are some of the situations I see. Um, there also the other you know area uh, that the government can support, uh, not only in terms of the uh, you know on the funding side, uh, is also around the issue of regulations, uh, because uh, the regulatory environment. Uh, in some ways may inhibit uh, unlocking uh, those types of capital. Uh, for instance, we are seeing uh, in most markets, it takes you know, I mean, an average mini grid company up to a year just to, uh, to achieve regulatory compliance. Uh, and in some cases, they are in danger of missing out on the funding deadlines for some of these uh, RBF facilities. So uh, you know, lowering, lowering that operational and administrative uh, bottleneck in terms of licensing and approvals uh, that can go a long way in terms of unlocking more capital for for some of these projects. Yeah, I can think. I think I can stop there for now. Okay, thank you, Daniel, um, and thank you for bringing in a few another a few other perspectives as well, like regulation, national government, and uh, energy prices. Um, so I would like to hand over to uh, Dana, our last uh, speaker, um, Dana. Uh, the World Bank is exploring and putting forward funds for both supply and demand set subsidies. And the discussion definitely shows that subsidy design is complex, but they are essential to reach everyone. So what are the key highlights you would take back from the discussion today? And what can the bank do more to promote the use of subsidies? So over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I will have to ask my daughter to be quieter. And I can go. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, it's um, I have so many um, insights that I'm taking from this discussion that it's um, it's almost hard to know where, where to start. Uh, so thank you to to Stephen, to Nipunika, and as well as to panelists for these uh, really useful insights. Um, I would start by by saying that it, it's incredible how much uh, this discussion has moved. If we had, uh, I think I think Stephen alluded to it. If we had this discussion four years ago, we would have we wouldn't have this discussion because. Uh, 
subsidy were almost a bad word uh, to consider and no one wanted to touch it. If we had it two years ago, uh, we would uh, have very opposing view and fierce fights. And um, we have it today. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost to say it's getting a little boring because uh, I think there's a lot of consensus that is being reached and a lot, a lot of agreement. But I would also say it's getting more interesting because you know, discussing if and uh, when, but we're discussing really how, how to do it in a way that these subsidies really are um, effective in reaching ultimately everyone and helping achieve a universal aspect. So um, maybe um, just, just starting a few things that I found very interesting. I, I found uh, Stephen's um, uh, presentation very, very useful in terms of bringing this uh, this larger picture of, of subsidies. And, and I, I think what is important, what you know, we sometimes are so much lost in the present that we, we forget the past. And I think what he brings back is uh, also the discussion that actually I remember when I started in energy access space about 20 years ago, there were a number of papers written about subsidies and cross subsidies for the poor. By the time everything was focusing on the grid because the grid was basically at that time, almost the only way how to how to how to reach uh, um, how to reach people, and everything was focusing on grid electrification. But there are lots of examples that come from that time that could be used uh, for off grid as well. But there's been quite a bit of um, shyness to apply these principles to to off grid electrification, and partly uh, for good reasons, but partly also due to misconceptions. Uh, and one of them has been that you know when the off-grid solutions came in, there was just a lot of enthusiasm because suddenly for the countries that have not been able to expand the grid, uh, like uh, most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, there was an alternative. There was a solution that was modular, was cheaper. And I think there was uh, just a lot of belief that these solutions in the market actually will reach everyone. What's happening is that we now know that um, this uh, this is not happening and this will not happen. The markets on, the, on its own are not going to reach everyone. And therefore there is a uh, case for subsidies, but there is also a legitimate concern about large scale use of subsidies in the in the off grid sector. Um, and this is, uh, as, as, as Daniel mentioned, I think in the mini grid sector, mini grid sector was the first one that has moved into embracing the need for subsidies, uh, uh, because uh, without subsidies, uh, the, the tariff to the consumers is just is just too too high. And so this notion of viability funding or performance-based grants um, uh, that are needed to uh, to reduce the investment cost is, is very much um, accepted. But in the in the standalone off-grid sector, the problem is that it, it, it's more it's more complex sector because it's based on actually companies selling products to the household, whether they sell them on cash basis or through place you go, you still you still you still you're still selling them. And if suddenly a program comes, uh, whether it's a government or a donor with uh, basically reducing the prices for these products for some households, uh, especially if it is uh, sort of subsidy that it's targeting to, to reduce the cost of these, uh, these products for some households, the other households may stop paying for the product even though uh, they can afford them. So, so one has to be a little careful that, you know, in the end, uh, these subsidy programs do not uh, end up uh, uh, slowing down the pace of electrification. Uh, but uh, rather increasing it, especially if there is just not enough money to subsidize everyone, which often is the case, and if the subsidies uh, may be short-lived, uh, because then you know what happens when they when they expire. And for this reason, I think what we have seen up to up to now is that off-grid sector has much more embraced uh, supply-side subsidy as well, uh, such as uh, reserve-based fin financing, as has been mentioned. The World Bank uh, has been um, uh, building up result-based financing schemes for off-grid solar and providing um, enabling working capital uh, for for the companies. And I I was I was very relieved to to hear from Linda that uh, you know the second round of COSA, which is World Bank uh, funded program, uh, has actually implemented um, a lot of lessons learned from the from the first round and is more accessible to to local companies. Um, but but the the, the, the the focus has been on, on, on eliminating the supply barriers. And that's, that's a part of the story. Uh, and it is an important part of the story because if the products are not even available in the area where people live, of course they, they cannot get it. And they're, then they're stuck with either 
low quality products or kerosene or, or other things. So it, it's an important first step, but it's not, I agree, and this is not enough. And in fact, um, in, the, in the research that we published uh, this February in the of grid market trends report, we have estimated that to achieve universal electricity access by 2030, the off-grid sector will need to serve over 600 million people uh, with at least uh, tier one products. And we have also warned that um, if a combination of supply and demand side subsidies is not available, then some 230 million people will not be reached, either because they live in remote locations that are too expensive to serve, or because of the affordability constraints, and in many cases, actually, um, the, because of the two combined constraints at the same time. And, and we should remember this was this research was done before COVID. So now, if you if you add impact of the COVID, uh, this number will be much larger, especially since it's estimated that you know the COVID could push as many as 150 million people back to extreme poverty. So to, to reach everyone, this affordability issue has to be um, resolved and demand side subsidies will be needed. And the question is how to design them so that they, they really are helpful rather than harmful. And I, I, it is something that really is uh, um, something we are looking into and we are very happy to work with everyone who is, um, who is involved in the, um, in the similar research. So I, I know I have to summarize, so just quickly. I think what we need moving forward is to is to do this right build more understanding and more evidence uh, what uh, works uh, and and why and this is why the the research by Nipunikar specifically looks into into one country's scheme is, is so useful because it goes into those details that are needed to understand what worked and what didn't work and why and sometimes it's not design it's the implementation issue sometimes it is what's missing uh, 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 not just uh, what the, what the, whether the subsidy is well designed or not. Um, I think second, uh, we need to sort of get away from this silo how these subsidies sometimes are designed, the off-grid people trying to figure it out on their own, clean cooking on their own, grid, many mm -hmm. grids, and, and try to come up with, uh, help government to design the schemes that actually can work across different technologies fairly, and this is where I thought that the Stevens uh, research was pointing in the right direction. Um, we need more more examples on the ground, uh, uh, more um, more more real examples and, and 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 evidence, and learn from that how to target, especially how to target demand side subsidies. The key issue of demand side subsidies is is targeting, and if uh, they are mistargeted, they can do more harm than good. So how do we actually learn uh, how to use the data that exists as as um, uh, as was discussed today? how to improve uh, the schemes that exist to, to really get this targeting right. Um, uh, fourth, I think we need to look uh, innovatively into sustainable sources of financing for subsidies. You know, um, impact bonds could be explored more. Uh, and the research that we have just published on, on clean cooking, we have come up uh, with the estimate that um, the, the, the combined health, gender, and climate externalities uh, cost $2.4 trillion every year. And so, you know, how to how to monetize these benefits, how to get sustainable funding out of basically these externalities is another area that that, that could really open up uh, many many new avenues. And I think fifth is we need a good coordination among everyone who may be um, uh, developing uh, the the subsidy scheme so that we don't undermine each other. So, so so thanks a lot for this uh, for this forum because it's exactly a way to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for all your um, your nice recommendations and overview of um, the challenges and uh, also some history. Um, so we discussed a bit, but we would like to skip the second poll because we are a bit short in time and we would like to provide some time for questions from uh, the audience. So um, if all the panelists could uh, turn on the camera and then uh, we have quite a bunch of questions and if you have, still have a few, you can uh, post them in the Q&A box. And um, I would just like to uh, start from uh, the beginning and you can vote them up. But um, the first question has uh, quite a number of votes as well. And it's on uh, cooking and knowing the, the, the big gap for clean cooking um, I think it's uh, it's good to start with cooking. And the question is for Martin Price. 
uh, saying, could you say a little bit more about the design of good subsidy programs for clean cooking specifically? And it's addressed to uh, Stephen. So Stephen, can you answer that question? No, absolutely. And I I'm, I'm certainly don't have any um, silver bullets on this. I mean, of course, it's no, um, you know, the reason why there's, of course, a much bigger gap with clean cooking is because it is such a complicated area. And then, you know, it's much more complicated than, say, a simple, you know, relatively simple grid electricity system, for instance, where with cooking, you have so many different value chains and you need to think about the existence of the traditional biomass um, value chain, thinking about in a lot of markets, LPG and gas value chains. You need to think about the interaction with the consumer and so on. And so there's so many kind of interacting parts and it's in many ways, I think much, much more complicated than uh, electricity. What I would say from the examples we looked at is it again illustrates some of the, the, the challenges though that I talked about. I mean, if we talk about, um, uh, we looked at examples in Nepal and in India on the clean cooking side, and it'd be interesting, it might be that Satish has something to say on this, but um, in India, for instance, we saw subsidies for um, LPG stoves in the first place, but then you're not really thinking about the sustainability again um, and the subsidies for the fuel itself over the long term. So again, we've got you know, essentially affordability gaps that may persist for some time there that were not properly addressed by the subsidy scheme. And it'll be interesting to see how the results from that scheme kind of evolve over time, especially in light of the, the economic challenges being um, faced now. But I would say one thing on what we could do, um, it's very difficult, as I was saying, in the clean cooking space to really define what the, the system is. You know, a grid you can draw a regulatory ring around and define a set of regulatory and commercial arrangements to, to try and get the money into that system. With clean cooking, it's much more difficult to define the boundaries of that system. But I don't think it's beyond our sort of collective abilities to work out where we might draw that boundary and then how we define a set of regulatory and commercial mechanisms to get the money into that system. So I think at the it's nuts and bolts, you kind of think about it in the same way, but I, you know, I, we're a long way from cracking it. So it's a collective responsibility. Huh? Yeah. yeah, indeed. Um, so I would like to move over to uh, a question from um, Johanna Galan. Uh, again, sorry, for Stephen again. <laughs> So you can uh, continue. How would you envision a cross subsidy to work in contexts like Africa, where operate solar is targeting very low income and utilities are already under immense financial pressure? And would, could, what could a long term model look like in your view? No, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and I think in my uh, presentation, I sort of acknowledge that you certainly can't take the the, the Thai example that I was talking through, for instance, and just drop that into Sub-Saharan Africa, it's not, it's not going to work for precisely the reasons that Johanna um, highlights. Um, but what I'd say, and I don't, certainly don't pretend to have all the answers on this either, but we do know from other sectors and from things we've done in the on-grid electricity sector, for instance, generally how to create sort of credit worthy entities and to tackle specific problems that sit behind that credit worthiness and to tackle them with the different financial instruments and so on and insurance products and all the rest of it that the IFIs have uh, available. It's not to say it's simple and of course it varies from country to country how deployable some of those instruments are um, but I would say that at its heart we kind of need to find a way of perhaps creating some sort of separate vehicle that can be used to administer subsidy to achieve energy access goals. And that might be sort of, it might be regulated, but it might be, be at arm's length from, from government. And the source of funds that goes into that vehicle will evolve over time. So as I was saying, with the phased approach in one of the slides, you would move from a situation that initially is very much dependent on donor funding, uh, but eventually has that target model in in, in mind and in some countries you might get to that target model quite quickly it might be on decadal time scales in other countries um, particularly in some of the sub-saharan countries that the question refers to okay thanks um i would like to move over to a question from christina singer um um whoever feels like answering um she says i would appreciate a discussion around what is lacking in, in getting the commitment of public finance 
national budget and donors to the policy and budget shift necessary for subsidy, subsidies to close affordability gap. So I would say Daniel and uh, Nipunika maybe. Yeah, um, I, I think for where I look at things is um, in, in some governments, I think um, there's still like a philosophical, um, you know, argument to be made around the need for, you know, uh, utilities 2.0 in, in that, you know, decentralized grids are actually the grids for the future. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, um, some governments might still want to, you know, electrify uh, parts of the population, you know, a huge chunk of the population with, uh, you know, the public grids. And we've seen a lot of pressure in some countries where, you know, the public grids are really pushed further and further into uh, areas that are really deemed non-commercial for the type of infrastructure they have. So I think in that regard, you know, there's a role for, you know, both private sector donors, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, other partners to, you know, to try as much as possible to push, um, you know, focus around national electrification planning to be, uh, you know, all inclusive in terms of all technologies, um, you know, having sort of a least cost approach where, you know, uh, you know, a given community will only be electrified, you know, basically using the technology that is, you know, cost efficient for, for that, for the, you know, for the dynamics of that community. And in that regard, you would also see a situation where uh, public funding would be efficiently allocated because right now, um, you know, the, you know, when you're talking about for public funding, we are, uh, in some cases, you know, these, these amounts of, uh, of capital looks, uh, look massive, but if you actually now, um, you know, use an integrated, you know, least cost planning approach, um, you know, in some cases you'd find, you know, it, you know, it might not be as high as initially thought using a centralized model. Um, I think on the, on the second, you know, question around RBFs, um, I think ultimately, uh, you know, uh, most of the, you know, RBFs should be focused around scale, at least, uh, you know, where we sit from the mini grid side of things, uh, because uh, we are at this point in time, most, uh, most mini grid uh, companies, uh, you know, might be you know, might be operationally at break even, but in terms of because they actually you know have few sites, uh, you know from their you know from their larger portfolio they are, they are still non profitable. So uh, creating uh, you know RBFs can be a tool at you know you know moving companies from building you know um, you know hundreds of sites a year to thousands of sites, and in that case you you reach at a point where uh, you know, commercial investors can actually see, uh, you know, uh, you know, a quantum of assets they can actually uh, pre-finance because at this point in time, uh, you know, most of the investors feel that, you know, the ticket size would be too small, um, depending on, uh, on, on you know, because the sites are also very few and also uh, far in between. Um, so there's that need to to increase the deployment rate, uh, if I must say. And also, you know, the challenge, you know, aligned with that is, um, you know, some of the programs actually take uh, quite long so that the lag in between, you know, uh, uh, structuring some of the programs to actual deployment um, and actually targeting the deployment to, uh, to, to, to more, more capital allocation to, to actual projects rather than other aspects of, of, of projects, uh, you know, like regulations and others, which are also important, but also ensuring that that efficient allocation is, is quite key. Uh, if I may say, from a mini perspective. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I'm afraid we uh, run out of time, so um, we can't have um, the other panelists uh, responding and do more questions, although we had quite a nice uh, set of questions. But um, that is promising for uh, a continuation of the debate, I would say. Um, so I would like to uh, wrap up by uh, thanking all of you, the speakers, uh, presenters, as well as the participants and uh, all the interesting, for posing all the interesting questions um, for your participation. And um, I think it was a very fruitful exchange. And um, um, it's um, very promising to continue this uh, discussion and, um, and to try to uh, put our words into practice and uh, see uh, in the coming time how we, uh, how we can change things. Um, so we did have a second poll, so if you're willing to and you still have time, you can take the time after um, I have ended the session um, by filling it in. 
Um, and uh, with this, I would like to thank all of you and um, see you next time. Thank you.